should have just come back about uh, what eight rows and be close to all of you. I don't have a cold, have nothing contagious, but it looks like you're afraid to get close. The Sermon on the Mount. I doubt that there is any sermon more readily recognized than the one that is recorded in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. That sermon is going to be the basis for our studies tonight, next Sunday night, and then the first Sunday in April. Because uh, on the 22nd, or thereabouts, uh, Harry is going to be speaking. 24th, is it, Harry? I don't pay any attention to calendars. He'll be speaking at our morning and evening assembly. And then the last Sunday of this month, our young men will be leading our worship. And I honestly don't remember who's scheduled to speak, but I know that they have been scheduled and uh, they'll show up. It may be John. Is it John? Yep. Okay. So you all can come if you want. Uh, I might mention there will be appetizers after, so I anticipate a decent crowd, John. Uh, be prepared. The record of this sermon begins in seeing the multitude. Jesus went up into a mount, and when he was set, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. If we were following the example of our Lord, all of you would be standing and I would be seated. Which happens to appeal to me, but I suspect doesn't appeal to you at all. It's extremely difficult to fall asleep standing. And I suspect, in part, that's why the process in the first century differed from our present arrangement. You see, when Jesus took his seat there on the hillside, he was doing what teachers typically did. They sat, and their students stood and listened. And you can see, I think, how effective that would be. You are compelled to stay awake, and it is in your best interest to listen. And if the teacher has things that are worthwhile to share and he shouldn't be teaching, if he doesn't, uh, you're in a better position to be receptive. I have lost count of how many times people have walked out and said to me, Roger, I'm so sorry I fell asleep. I never noticed that. Uh, with rare exceptions, we had a dear lady who sat in the front and would fall asleep and lean her head back and have her mouth wide open through the entire sermon. But most of the time, I never notice. And usually when it happens, it's an indication that someone is on medication or just didn't get enough rest the night before. And I don't take it personally. Maybe I should, but I don't. I happen to think that preachers are not entertainers. And I have never felt compelled to stand in the pulpit and entertain anyone. I feel compelled to the best of my ability to always be biblical, and not simply biblical, but uh, biblically sound, so that what you hear comes from the Word of God, and if it is presented with clarity, it cannot help but help. I've listened to lots of preachers over the years, and I have on occasion thought, that really wasn't all that well presented, but the message was faithful to the Word, and I have to admit, I have profited every time, and it taught me over the course of time a powerful lesson. What I get from any message will be determined by what I put into it. If I daydream, if I sleep, if my focus is misplaced and I'm simply looking for the errors that are made, and I make many grammatical, grammatical errors, and I have problem with pronunciation and enunciation on occasion, and I tend to talk uh, 
perhaps a little faster than some. And you may find fault with that, and that's fine. You're entitled to your opinion. But please keep in mind that the primary purpose is to draw us all to the Word, and in our encounter with the Word, we're drawing closer to our God and our Savior. Now, the fact remains that there's probably no sermon that you know better than the one that we're going to be looking at tonight and the two additional Sunday evenings. We know what our Lord said. But the question that I raise in the context of this particular message is this. Do we know what he meant? I think there are many times that we look at Scripture and what is said is easily seen, heard, and can be repeated. But I can't say with the same confidence that having seen and heard that we can always honestly say, and I know what he meant. This particular sermon can be broken down into three clear segments divided by chapter. And therefore, we will look at chapter 5 this evening and the succeeding messages, chapter 6 and 7. Chapter 5 begins with the Beatitudes. Uh, you're familiar with them. They were read uh, by Harry very capably uh, a few minutes ago, and uh, nothing there that you haven't heard many times in the past. Probably you can repeat most, if not all, of them. What was Jesus conveying in those first 12 verses? Blessed is a word that uh, could as easily be translated happy or using the expression, oh, the joy. The word in the original is makarios. I know that means nothing to you, but I want you to know that modern English probably captures for all of us the essence of what is said in these 12 verses better than the King James, which was on the board behind me a few minutes ago, and what I put to memory, and perhaps many of you did as well. If the word blessed, as it is used here, could be translated, and perhaps should be translated, happy, I would submit to you tonight that in these Beatitudes, what Jesus is conveying is this simple idea. You will never find happiness where most people are looking. If you were to ask someone, perhaps if you sat this evening for five minutes and contemplated what would make me truly happy if I'm not there already, I doubt, honestly, that your responses would be in any way akin to what Jesus said in these 12 verses. And you'd be wrong, because Jesus is always right. You're not going to find happiness if you have more money. And yet everybody seems to think that the key to happiness is just having more money or more things. But money and things have never really satisfied. And in fact, if you read Paul's first letter to Timothy, as it draws to a close in chapter 6, he makes the observation, and he's absolutely right, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And Jesus doesn't address money. He doesn't address power or fame or any of the other things that the world seems to value so highly and believes will provide greater happiness if possessed. In fact, he does just the opposite. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs, he says, is the kingdom of heaven. Now, I realize that the poor in spirit doesn't have anything to do with financial well-being. 
He's not saying that poor people are happier than rich people, though often that may be the case. That's really not what he's addressing at all. The poor in spirit are those who approach the day with the right attitude, an attitude of humility, a recognition of our hopelessness and helplessness on our own and how God fills the void, enables us to be in the kingdom, his children, and possess what can be found nowhere else. No one will really know genuine happiness until they know their lostness apart from Jesus and come to him on his terms to find from him what can be found nowhere else, the forgiveness of sin, the peace that passes understanding, the providence of God at work in our lives every day, and the hope that when life ends and eternity begins, we will be in the presence of our Creator forever. And we need to long for that more than we long for anything else. Blessed, he said, are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And we don't typically associate mourning with happiness. And yet Jesus does in this text. But again, it's not simply sorrow that he has in mind. It is mourning over the things that ought to be mourned over. What are they? The typical plight of sinners and the ruin that sin ultimately brings to bear on those who refuse to address it on God's terms. Mourning over lives that are in turmoil because they are not turning everything over to God and letting him be with them to work through them. Now, if you were paying attention, you know that God does not promise to his people that if we follow him, life is suddenly easier. We say all the time that being Christian doesn't mean that our burdens are lifted, that our problems are solved, that the obstacles in our path will be removed. What being a Christian means is we never are called to bear a burden too great for us and God to handle. We won't face a problem and have to face it on our own. There will always be the Lord who has promised to be at our side to never leave us nor forsake us. And the obstacles in our path can be great, but with the help of God they can be overcome. And if you look at this section, each time Jesus speaks, he takes something that we never associate with happiness and says, but this... This is where genuine joy will be discovered. So I ask what I believe Jesus was asking of his disciples on this occasion. If you want to be happy, are you looking for happiness in all the right places? Most aren't. And so the challenge to us is to focus on being poor in spirit. Mourning over the things that really matter. The psalmist in the 119th Psalm said many wonderful things. Among them, the observation, rivers of water run down my cheeks because they keep not your law. Are you brought to tears over the plight of the lost? Are you saddened by the fact that it seems every day that people are drifting further and further from the truth, are less receptive to the gospel? Determine not to be among that number and to do all you can to redirect people back to God's word, back to truth and righteousness. He goes on to talk about the joy of the meek, of those who hunger and thirst, and that's not anything we would associate with joy, or at least I certainly wouldn't. But notice the emphasis is on hungering and thirsting after righteousness. 
if we would address the needs of our soul with the same devotion and intensity that we address the needs of our bodies, it would be clearly transformative. How many of you intentionally miss meal after meal after meal? Unless you're sick or dieting, you tend to be somewhat regular in your meals. I think all of us are familiar with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. When I grew up, it was supper, but I grew up in the country. And then there's always the snack or snacks, and we're pretty faithful to all of that because our bodies tell us that we're hungry and we satisfy that hunger. But there is so much more joy to be gained when we realize that our souls need to be refreshed. And we long to satisfy the needs of the soul even more than the needs of the body. That's the kind of thing that Jesus is saying in the first 12 verses. So what I want you to take with you when you leave tonight is an understanding that Jesus clearly reveals that happiness comes only when we look for it in the right places, and they are enumerated here in these 12 verses. Now, the second thing that occurs is found in verses 13 through 16. And again, because this sermon is so familiar, you know the statements. Jesus looked at his disciples and said, you could almost imagine him looking at you, can't you? And he's going to say this to you, you. Think, me, myself. Jesus is speaking to me. He says, you're the salt of the earth. And that terminology has become so commonplace that everybody understands that if somebody is the salt of the earth, that a real tribute has been paid to that person. There's something unique and special about them. And of course, you can't help but think of the things that salt represents. Purity is first and foremost, is it not? The whiteness of salt is a symbol of purity. There's a certain antiseptic quality that salt possesses. And again, having grown up in the country and butchering uh, every uh, year, chickens, turkeys, hogs, beef, Knowing how to deal with meat, and particular pork, uh, was essential. We salt cured hams and shoulders on occasion. Also, sometimes smoked them, but that has nothing to do with Jesus' terminology. Salt preserved. It enabled the meat to be held until it needed to be utilized, preserved, and He's saying that if you are my disciples, you're going to exert a preservative influence on the world. And of course we do that through the sharing of the message of the gospel. But there's a third thing that salt does, and probably the one that we most identify with today that is generally not even considered. Salt just makes things taste better. And if you're on a salt free diet, the best word to describe it is bland. And I don't think anybody really enjoys a bland diet. And you certainly wouldn't want to be described, uh, your character is bland. (laughs) I don't think you'd take that as a compliment. And so I'm submitting to you that Jesus, as he says, you're the salt of the earth, had the idea of purity, preservation, but also the the concept of making things better, spicing things up, so to speak, to use modern language, to just make life richer and more wonderful. I've tried my entire preaching life to say to young people, if you really want to live a good life, listen to God, not the devil. Be students of God's Word and follow what you find therein. And I know it's not going to take you in the direction that most people are going, and others will look at you and dismiss you as being old-fashioned and living a life without real joy, but that's not true. 
following God's word will spare you a whole lot of hurt and misery and bring you far more blessings than we could ever begin to describe. You will actually enjoy life more and the people around you will enjoy life more because of the influence that salt your life will have on theirs. And we've not always done a good job of that. I suspect that every one of us can think of one or more Christians who were just just not people you wanted to be around. Rather than lifting you up, they, they always pulled you down. They never really seemed to understand the joy that Christians are to have and the importance of radiating, radiating that to the people around them. And if you want some demonstration of this, I would urge you to read Paul's letter to the Philippians. In that epistle, over and over and over again, Paul urges the saints to rejoice, to be joyous, to be happy. He says, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. So try in your life, Jesus is saying, to be pure. Try to have a positive saving influence and certainly convey to the people around you the joy that a relationship with the Father through the Son brings to life. And then he utilizes a second expression that we're just as familiar with. You're the light of the world. And light throughout the Bible represents righteousness, goodness, Sometimes salvation and darkness represents sin and Satan and death. We're to live light so that we are lights pointing out the dangers of sin and pointing men in the direction of God. Light dispels the darkness. It makes the way known and that light, as you utilize this text, is to be an influence for good in the home, in the community or the city, and ultimately the world. And so I ask the question of you, when Jesus says you're the salt and light, what exactly is he talking about? And my response is this. Jesus is saying to us very pointedly, people, you're being watched. Others are looking at your life and how you conduct yourself every day. Make sure that they see in you what they ought to see from God's child. If there is no difference between the Christian and the non-Christian, in the manner we live, the way we treat each other, our goals, and so many other things, then what is the essence of discipleship? What's the value of faith? If it's not transformative, then it's nothing at all. So remember every day, everywhere you go, with everyone that you are associated with, they're watching. And they're judging our Lord and his church by what they see in us. So look for happiness where it can be found. And don't forget the world's watching. Be salt and light. What does that mean that we live a life that becomes the gospel of Christ? Philippians 1, 27. That you follow after peace and holiness without which we can't see the Lord. Hebrews 12, 14. That we live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, Titus 2.12. That we come out from them, the world, and be separate, saith the Lord. All of those things and many others are seen in the concept that the world is watching. Let's make certain we're salt and light.
And then, beginning in verse 17 and going through the close of chapter 5, you have Jesus saying to those who stood around him there on the mountainside, I did not come to destroy the law or the prophets. I came to fulfill them. I am here because it fulfills God's purpose. I am here to save you, to offer my life as God had planned long before any of us ever existed to be the remedy for sin and the means of salvation. And you know the law. I want you to know that as my disciples, it's not enough to follow the law. Jesus raised the bar. The standards are now higher in Christ than they ever were under the law. And what follows through the remainder of chapter 5 is a series of illustrations depicting how Jesus raised the bar. He begins in verses 21 and 22, with the concept of murder. The law says you shall not murder. The King James says kill, but clearly the meaning of the word was murder. And it's easy to say, is it not, I've never murdered anyone. I think I know all of you well enough to say that you've never murdered anyone either. But Jesus says, that's not enough. You may think it is, but what I say to you is this. You should not hate your brother. Don't harbor ill will in your heart. Don't let hatred well up in your body and soul. I've never murdered anybody, but I can't honestly say I haven't felt like it. You haven't wanted to run somebody down, I'd never follow up on it, but you know, those emotions that if not kept in check can lead to serious reaction, Jesus says that's where, as we would say, the rubber meets the road. It's not enough not to murder. Don't let hatred develop in your heart. And if you go to Colossians 3 and read the description of the new man, you put away anger wrath and malice. These are the things that lead to murder. And if you don't allow those things in your heart, murder never becomes an issue. Then he turns his attention to the second issue of adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But he says, as a Christian, as my disciple, there's a higher standard. You need to know that if a man looks upon a woman with lust in his heart, he has committed adultery already with her in his heart. This is where the battle is fought. With murder, so with adultery. Then he addresses the matter of swearing in verses 33 and 34. The law says don't swear falsely. And obviously you can understand the value of that. God's people should be truthful. But Jesus says, that's really not enough. The key is not to swear at all. Become a person whose word is their bond. When you say yes, people know you mean yes. And when you say no, they know that you mean no. Anything beyond this leads to sin. And so again, he raises the bar. And then he talks about retaliation. Tit for tat. You hit me, I'll hit you back harder. Getting even. Vengeance, if you please. But he says if someone slaps you on the cheek, you turn the other. Please understand that the slap was an insult. And we could easily simply say if somebody insults you, don't insult them in return. Don't lower yourself to their standard. Jesus raised the bar. 
you can do better. He used the illustration of going the second mile under Roman law, as you probably know in the first century, a Roman soldier, any Roman soldier, because Palestine was an occupied land, could place the tip of his spear on any Jewish man and compel that man to go with him for a mile. Jesus says, go too. And I would hasten to add, and don't grumble and complain throughout the journey. Do more than is expected. People today either want to do less than is expected or only do what is expected, but Jesus says, no, you're my disciples. You're better than that. And if you go again to Colossians, you'll find in chapter 3, Paul arguing that this new man in Christ will do whatever he does heartily. That is, with enthusiasm, bringing his or her best to whatever situation we're dealing with because we realize as Christians, with the world watching us, that we live all of life in the presence of God and everything we do ought to be done for His approval. Not the approval of others, but the approval of our Maker and our Savior. So in that fifth chapter, Jesus uses very familiar language to convey powerful messages that, in my judgment, I label it for what it is, we don't always get. We know the words and we can repeat them, but we don't always understand what he meant. And sometimes, sadly, we may know what he meant and choose to disregard it. So the crucial question, anytime we're looking at Scripture, and certainly in the context of Jesus' preaching ministry, we have to ask, are we really listening? Are we taking in his message? And do we leave resolve to follow his direction? If you want to be happier, it's possible, but you'll never reach your goal following the world. You have to follow the word to do that. And if you want to be used by God in a meaningful and positive way, you have to be salt and light. You have to know everywhere you are that people are watching. They're judging our Lord and His church by what they see in you. Make sure that they see what they ought to see. And never, never console yourself by saying, I'm as good as the next fellow, because that will never be good enough. I'm doing enough to get by. That will never be enough. I just have to do the minimum. I've got a grandson that believes that's how school is to be handled. Just enough to get by. I'm comfortable with that, he would say. I love him to death, but that's not the right attitude. And it's certainly not the attitude we ought to have with God. He's raised the bar, and we need to strive every day to live up to the standard. He has said, will we ever succeed and master the demands of our Lord? No. But we can all do better. And that's what Jesus is calling us to do as his disciples. Next Sunday night, God willing, we'll look at chapter 6 as Jesus continues to provide instruction for his disciples as to how they conduct themselves. And we'll find there again that what he says has real meaning for Christians, but is the opposite of what the world advocates. So listen to the word, not the world, and God will bless you for it. Uh, we'll close in just a moment with the song that Colton has selected. We always extend an invitation from the Lord, an opportunity for any in our assembly who are not Christians to come to Christ on his terms and to leave a child of God, having been washed by the blood of the Lamb in a watery grave, raised to walk in newness of life, to find happiness where Jesus says it's found, to be salt and light in a world that desperately needs both.
and to strive to live up to the standards that Jesus set when he raised the bar. Let's aim high. You're subject to his call. We invite you to come as we stand and sing.